Thank you very much for joining. Uh, this is about top three big data governance issues and how Apache Atlas resolves it for the enterprise. Wow. Um, as a disclaimer, I didn't come up with that title. Somebody else did. Um, if you were here for the earlier session, I did come up with that title. Um, so earlier today, we talked about um, business catalog. And we devoted a whole session for that. So I don't want to spend too much time on that today. If you have any specific questions, um, one of my favorite topics, um, perhaps we can talk about it uh, towards the end if we have time, or perhaps we can um, meet in the back and we can talk about it further. Okay. All right, so here's some quick questions that we typically want to answer with big data. That's why you're here. Um, what do we know about that, our information? Where did it come from? And who can use it? How does this data adhere to company policies and rules? So these are, these are types of questions that you will need really to build out your practice, right? So technically speaking, we have great solutions. Um, the friction to get data into Hadoop is very low. There's all these great tools you can use. But even though you have this great resource and this capability, um, you, know, you need to govern this, right? You need to control its access because it has a lot of sensitive information, right? And without this control, you know, that whole analytic platform may not be available to you, right? Um, so one aspect of it is control, but the other question is, you know, where did it come from and who can use it? That's really important too. And even the first question, what do we know about our information? If you're a data scientist um, doing some work, right, trying to come up with new insights that you didn't have before, which is the whole point of your, uh, of your work, right, you come up with some new theories, you need, to even, you need to find out what basic building blocks you have, right, the raw sources of that insight. So just knowing what's available can be a huge help and save a lot of time, right? So kind of backtracking a little bit, we'll talk a little bit about the vision of Atlas. People ask, you know, what is Atlas all about, right? There's a lot of metadata tools already out there in the marketplace. In fact, the road is littered with them, right? So the point really is not to create something that's already there. Really, we're focusing on Hadoop, right? That's where we have our expertise. And really, we want to take that metadata that we're capturing Right? And we want to exchange it with others and also import that metadata as it comes into Hadoop. Hadoop is not the only you know, analytic platform in your enterprise. Right? We realize that. Data is going to be coming in. There will be some you know, useful work. And data is going to be moving back out. And we realize this. The metadata, along with that payload, needs to stay together. Right? That's very, very important. Right? In fact, you want to capture that metadata in the highest fidelity possible. Right? It's just a good way to go. Right? It gives you. Um, all the options that you're going to need um, going forward, right? So um, you can read the slide for yourself, right? We're going to be focusing on data management, modeling, and really interoperable solutions. So those are really the, the, big, the big blocks, right, for our vision, right? Uh, let me, if you will indulge me, I'm going to go through a quick overview because I think some of you, actually, can I get a show of hands? Have you ever had any material or exposure to Atlas before so I can kind of gauge? Wow. OK, so I'll go really quickly through this part. We can actually get more time for questions. Right? So it sounds like you guys know this part of it. So let me just kind of run through there. I kind of modified this slide from the last time you might have seen it. Right? Obviously, we started from um, DGI, which was a data governance initiative. But I added some more bullets. Right? So in December, in 2.4, we added um, cross-component lineage. Um, and we actually have elaborated on that since then. But we first introduced it um, about that time, around December. Um, of 16, sorry, it should be 15. There's a little typo there. Um, in the summer of this year, we'll be adding more features. That's uh, the business catalog, Active Directory integration, and versioning. So we'll talk about that more in detail. So that is a typo. I will fix it before we upload it. I think we can kind of skip over this part of it too. One of the, the key benefits, though, I do want to touch upon that. Really, the reason, the reason why you want to uh, engage in this effort to capture metadata and use that for management, obviously, are for those key benefits, right? Cost, diversity, and agility, right? So, you know, when, you, when you're really adopting the, um, the data lake as a strategy, these things come into play, right? It becomes more and more important. So, um, let me take a quick digression here to kind of set up the next few slides and actually kind of uh, make up for the ones I've already skipped to try to save time here. So a lot of folks, when they adopt Hadoop, they, they have a, a life cycle, right? They start off with a POC or a POT, 
right, just to make sure that it's not a science project, it actually is you know, a viable solution. And once they get that to work, they might expand that use case. And it'll still be narrow, but it might be very deep, right? It might be a problem that's not currently solvable by other platforms, right? Then there's a third state. And that third state really is that multi-tenant uh, environment, right? We have different silos of data, different types of users in the same place. And that's really where you get that big benefit. But consequently, that's where you have the most risk. And that's really the point where you need this kind of stuff, right? You need metadata tools. You need a new way of managing your data because the old paradigms will not work as your data scales, right? Um, kind of a high level architecture, there's some things that we've changed, right? Um, the first thing um, is data lineage. Um, so we have new components, which uh, we can talk about um, later in the slide. Um, agile modeling, this has always been there, but now it's a lot easier, right? Specifically with those business aspects of it. If you were in the earlier session, we talked about the business catalog and modeling that um, those conceptual and logical elements. Um, REST API, this is also something that's been around, but it is still very important. We've expanded this to include integration with additional third parties. Right? They've really leveraged this capability to do really cool things. In fact, this is a shameless plug for another session. Right? We're going to extend the governance capabilities by really integrating with other partners. There we have Ativo, Waterline, and Trifacta. Right? And lastly, exchange. We want to exchange metadata with other parties. Right. And this is the last piece of it, the uh, governance certification program. And this is actually what I was referring to earlier. The idea is that you know, when you're working really hard to get this metadata, well, what are you going to do with it? You want to leverage it for all kinds of different reasons, right? Um, but there might be some activities that may not be within the Hadoop platform currently, right? May not be in the scope of the things that we do. Uh, or may, might, may not make sense for us to do that. So let's take the first bubble, the discovery and tagging piece, right? While we may be able to import data and understand maybe the schema, um, some you know, metrics around that, we may not understand what's happening inside of the payload itself. And so you know, companies like Waterline, Data Guys, Ativo, and others, they can actually crack open that payload and actually do introspection. They can do pattern matching. Um, and they can do a lot of these additional types of functions that really isn't appropriate for perhaps you know, the HTTP platform. The benefit, though, is that they leverage our metadata, right? So they actually write back those tags or that information about their schema or whatever else that they might be able to uh, discern, right? That benefit really helps us and helps the whole ecosystem because the next bubble, let's say prep and cleanse, somebody like Trifacta can pick up that information and now do some other types of activities. The benefit there is that they can cooperate in an ecosystem, right? The key is that that metadata, your metadata, is not uh, encrypted, it's not stored offline. Really, it's, it's an open format that you control. The benefit really is that it lowers switching costs. You can try new things, you can write your own pieces, things can happen in parallel. So really, that agility, that, that, you know, that safety is really something that you get with embracing an open solution. And that's really what we're talking about here. So this is the last pillar of the overview. I promise it'll, we'll get to something more exciting afterwards. But this is a big deal, right? If there are vendors you're already using for uh, certain types of activities, for visualization or the, for compliance reasons, there's a very good chance we have them on our list of vendors to, you know, to interact with and provide integrations. Um, if you'd like to see a few of those vendors kind of, kind of moved up in priority, we're happy to do that. We can talk about that offline. Right. Oh, here's the list. We finished Waterline and Data Guys and Ativo, right? And so um, they're all um, in the area of maybe ingestion and introspection. And in process, we have Calibra, Alation, Meta Integration, our friends in Mountain View, Pexata, Syncsort, and Trifecta. We've 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 started work with them. Uh, in fact, we're going to have a few demos that uh, hopefully we'll show in that other session on Thursday. And then after that, we have SAP, specifically ILM, Vora, and uh, IBM IGC. There's a bunch of others. Um, I just wanted to throw this up there to show you that we're making good progress. Right? So what are you going to get in this near-term release? Right? We want to make sure that you get a proper view of what's coming. Um, we talked about the last one already, so I'm not going to really spend too much time there. But dynamic access policies. That's a pretty big one. That's a pretty big differentiator that no one else has, right? Can I get a show of hands if you've heard of this idea before? Okay, we've got two hands. 
three hands. Okay, cool. Um, I think my partner in crime might be here. She can't. If you want to, are you here? Can you raise your hand? Okay. Um, regarding uh, the dynamic access policies, uh, we'll talk about that cost component lineage, enterprise readiness, and business catalog. Let me jump into uh, dynamic access policies. So there's a new way to leverage metadata to control your data. So typically, you have a group of people, and you have a bucket of stuff, and then you make this kind of mapping, right? Um, really, that's great, except that if you have a lot of stuff, and you have a whole bunch of new stuff coming in, and you have a variety of stuff, it's hard to manage that, right? So in fact, it becomes untenable at some point. Really, what we want to do is use some kind of dynamic way to manage that access, right? So we want to map that group of people to a tag. And now we can reuse that tag wherever we need to. So an example would be PII, personally identifiable information, right? Now PII could be in a sales transaction, it could be in an HR file, it can be all over the place, but the idea is that it is a protected, sensitive bit of information, right? And what we want to be able to do is allow um, different groups to use a common set of tags and standards and policies to really enforce a uniform way of enforcing policy, right? So you can have many data stewards or curators or data domain experts, whatever you want to call them, they will categorize your data, but in terms of enforcement, we'll have one way of enforcing that, and that's through Ranger. So we'll have centralized policy creation, auditing, and reporting, right? That's basically it. So we have the tag-based policy, and we'll show you an example of that. Geography-based policy, um, that's really based on IP, and you can do a lot of really cool things there. So you can obviously resolve that to a location, right? So you can create a policy for a country or a state, right? Wherever you want to resolve that. Um, you can base it upon, you know, a class C, some special VLAN that you've created. And that might be a remote office. It might be a partner. And you may want to restrict certain types of access based upon that entry point. You can do that. Remote users, they shouldn't get unfettered access, right? So you can control all that. It's very, it's very powerful um, in doing that, right? So if uh, you have an analyst accessing data, they're in New York, but they jump in a plane, go to Switzerland, they have different privacy rules. Dynamically, without having to change anything, they get a different set of policies that they're evaluated against, right? That's the type of elegant policy that you want that can that can change and be flexible based upon you know, circumstances, right? You don't want to write a bunch of policies. In fact, if I show you the policy for that, it's very simple. Um, Time-based policies. This is different from eviction, which we can do with uh, Falcon already, right? You, know, you have trade data or some other type of data. You want to stash for seven years and then get rid of it. We, we can cover that. But you might want to do something else where you want to be a little bit more um, proscriptive and a little bit more gentle in terms of how you boot people off of that resource. If you're leasing data, Maybe you have research data from a university you're partnering with, right? And the lease is only for a certain amount of time. Or if you're doing some kind of actuarial processing and you, you only want to use those resources for a certain amount of time, well, you can put a nice time-based policy, right? After a certain amount of time, new access will stop and continuing processes can continue. You can set that timer up for like a Monday and then move the data on a Sunday the next, next week or whatever, right? So you have this flexibility, right? This also solves things like a 90-day SOX reporting policy, right? So if you garner data from the internet using you know, uh, browser data and you have it on an analytic platform, you have to report at a certain amount of time, well, guess what? You can just run this policy and make sure you're never in violation. Right? So a lot of really cool things you can do there. Um, prohibition, this is really just uh, making sure that uh, this is only for Hive and this is gonna stop good actors from making a mistake. Um, so, uh, prevent good actors from making a mistake, and it's basically toxic combinations. So if you have columns from different tables or even different databases, it prevents them from being combined together. Obviously, you can work around this, but this is to really give you some protection for those good actors making a mistake. This is at the platform level, so if there are applications sitting on top of Hive, you will be protected, right? All right. So how does it work at scale? Kind of talked about this already, but basically Atlas is gonna handle the metadata. That's where your data stewards are gonna do their work. And we're gonna pass that information to Ranger. And that's where the entitlements happen, right? Um, I think I talked about this already. So under the covers, this is what's happening. I'm gonna throw this slide up there before I kind of try to get into a demo. But essentially what's happening is 
We have a notification framework by which we basically broadcast changes. Ranger is one of the listeners. Um, it li listens for a certain type of message, and then it does something smart, right? It knows that it needs to modify its policy. So after it gets this uh, additional information, it does some special things to optimize it for speed, shoves it into an in-memory cache, and away you go. So this is really important, not only because of the mechanics of the way this works, but because that it's event-driven, right? It's not polling. And the other piece is that it's pretty fast, right? It happens in a few seconds. This is active protection, right? Many other products out there can give you maybe something like this, but they can't do it in an active way, right? So somebody who is a data steward in a different country could tag a table or a column PII, and somebody in another part of your organization would be immediately, you know, impacted, you know? Um, and that is what we mean by active protection. All right, so let me kind of Try my hand here. Okay, my. Okay. All right. So we do have Active Directory integration, as I mentioned, and I'll show you that in a bit. But one of the things I want to show you is, this is the business taxonomy. We did cover this in the other session. As much as I like this new UI, I'm going to try to gloss over some of the pieces just to get to the, the ceiling pieces here. So let me get too hard. So here, let's, let's take a look at employee. Poor little VM is working really hard. But um, as we get information, this is kind of stuff that we capture automatically. These properties, there's some tags associated with that. Oh, there are no tags associated with the table. There are some terms associated with it. Um, it is associated with employee. There's some audit information that we track, all the things that have been done to it, all those wonderful things that you know and love. And then we automatically capture schema. So it looks like somebody's been um, working here, and they've been tagging this asset um, a uh, couple of columns already as PII, right? So you can see name, location, and SSN. Sounds appropriate, right? Uh, there's a lineage, finally came up. And as I mouse over it, you can actually find out what's happening in that lineage. So it looks like somebody created a view as a select. Uh, they created uh, probably, they had probably some where clause, yep, for US residents, et cetera, et cetera, right? So you can, pretty standard stuff. You can walk through the lineage and get more information about it. But what I really wanted to show you was the fact that there's a bunch of columns that have been tagged, right? Now let me jump over to Ranger. And we actually happen to have a lot of Ranger experts here. So if you have some questions that I can't answer, they'll be here to talk about it. So in Ranger, um, we have some policies, which I've already gone over in the other session, where we can actually now, we have a whole other set where you can actually control fine-grained access to Atlas itself. So we've broken these down. And so we've already covered this, so I won't talk about it now, but it is available. If you have questions, I can address them later. We have resource-based policies, right? But we have this other thing called tag-based policies. And if we look at them, we have this really cool thing called a PII policy. If we look at it, we can see a little bit more about it. It's very elegant. It's very simple. Name, we have a tag. Uh, it's enabled. Logging is turned on. And we have a deny condition. So public, they don't have access. But there is an exception, HR admin. They can see this tag, right? This is very important. I'm going to jump over to Mbari and log in as HR user, which remember does not have access. I hope I typed this correctly. I'm just using Mbari Hive View just to write, just to send some sweet SQL over to, um, to uh, Hive Server 2. You can use pretty much anything to connect to it. This is just for illustrative purposes. It looks like under Hive. I'm uh, sorry, uh, under HR database, we have a couple of tables. We have employee, right? And you can see the different tables there. If I do a select star from hr.employee, let's see what happens. Boy, I can't get access to it. Well, the reason why I can't get access to it is because, obviously, these are protected by PII, and we know that we can't get access to them. So let's look at, a, uh, let's look at ID and join date. Now, those two are not protected. I hope I typed this correctly. Looks good. Don't forget the semicolon. 
and magically I can get that information. So obviously we can protect things at a column level, right? Now in Atlas, let's say I wanted to tag the whole table as PII. Let's see what happens there. Okay. And I may need to log out to make this work. We'll see. Yeah, I think I do. My poor little environment is working really hard. So I log back in as HR underscore user. User. Go back here. Should have opened another browser. That would have solved my problem. Okay. I can't even see the table, right? So within a few seconds, what I was able to do was, you know, create a brand new policy. So I use the same PII policy not only to protect columns. I could pick the whole table. I could do it for the database too. Right? So this is just one way to leverage this. I did this really quickly. We actually have a whole tutorial on this uh, that you can go through. But this is just a really a neat way to think about, a, a really new way to think about how to protect your data. Right? Now this isn't going to solve all of your problems, but this is going to give you more tools in your toolbox to do this. Right? Okay. Let's see here. The last thing I want to show you is, uh, actually we're in here, we can take a tour of some other things. So remember, we did talk about Active Directory integration. So you can use Atlas without Ranger, right? Uh, we have a file-based support, and you have to do a little work modifying some files. So that does work. Obviously, we recommend you use Ranger, um, and we have Active Directory integration there. So you can leverage those accounts, those users and groups that are in Active Directory in your enterprise already to specify um, those rules, right? So you can see the different types of users. We have internal and external. So those Active Directory users, users will show up as an external user. We can create groups. I've conveniently created, hey, one called Data Steward, and you can get information about that. And once uh, we set up policies uh, based upon that, we can provision the Data Steward group. So pretty straightforward stuff that you would expect, right? So the benefit of this is that you're leveraging things you already have expertise and operational processes around, right? So we're not recreating the wheel here, right? Consequently, if you yank them out of Active Directory, you know, you'll get the appropriate effect, right? It'll take a little while to, um, to propagate, but it will happen without having to do anything else, right? That's very important to get. The other thing I want to talk about is that new paradigm where we're having you know, a decentralized way to, to tag and leverage those policies, but a central way to do the auditing, and you can see the audits here. So let's, let's take a quick look here. So we're going to search by uh, tags, and we'll search for by PII, and see, we can see what happened, right? So Pretty straightforward. There's a bunch, you can kind of click through here, and there's quite a, uh, a number of different reporting options we have. This isn't a Ranger talk, but you know, it, it's, it's relevant, so I wanted to show that. Um, I just wanted to illustrate to you that we have this notion of having scalable you know, classification and centralized security, right? That, that's a takeaway. Okay. Any questions? Oh, quick one. Correct. You, you will not be able to run that query at all. Okay. If you don't have rights to that column, you cannot do any operations on it. Uh, we can kind of talk to the guts of, of the way that works. Actually, we intercept that. It actually never gets to Hive. Ranger um, is pretty efficient about the way it does policy enforcement. So there's a couple of intricacies, and the guys are actually sitting right in front of you. They can talk about PDP and PEP policy enforcement points, which basically acts like a traffic cop. It'll stop the access. It'll actually go to a decision point. It'll, it has already um, compiled basically the different policies, and it'll respond back with a, you know, allow or disallow. And so it'll actually never make it to Hive. So those erroneous or unallowed queries won't actually take up any resources in Hive. So it's actually you know, the right way to do it. Right? It's very efficient, and we can modify policies. Question? Um, I'll be honest with you, right now it does not. So if you have a derivative data set, right now it will not propagate forward right now. That's something that we're actively working on, right? Yes? So you're looking at um, forward passing the tag enforcement to somebody that's already logged on? 
So if they're already logged on, they're in the system, they're looking at PI data, or they're looking at a table that's not PI data until you import it as PI type. Well, OK, so are we talking about Hive? Well, any query. So they could be, they could be using show data points. They could be logging on through that. They could be logging on through any other query too. Yeah, that's specifically a ranger question. And the guy who's turning around looking at you is the guy with the answer. So, um, I, you know, I'm going to respectfully ask you to uh, let, bring that one up afterwards. Um, please remind me, and we will address that question. That's a very important one, right? OK. So, uh, yes, last question. So, the data lineage that you show as part of the Atlas? Yes. Um, we have the ability to manipulate the graph, and we can uh, increase it or reduce the magnification of it. That we have. I think what you're asking for is there a way that you could collapse them. Um, there isn't a good way to do that right now. Um, we're actually trying some different things out um, to try to make that available. Um, I know that some, some type of workflow, it's like uh, in a formal life, I used to work at the NYSE Euronext, and obviously we're covering all kinds of trading uh, scenarios. And uh, basically, our date of record was a trade, right? That was like the beginning. That was like the kernel. And everything hung off of that, right? So if I did a lineage graph, it would all go back to a trade, right? It came out of the matching engine. You know, Subrajit did a trade with, with the Selva. And then all the stuff happened, right? Um, not very helpful, actually. So we want to be able to collapse it or see a portion of that. So we do have some ideas where we can collapse certain pieces and show an icon to show that there's more for that. Uh, we just haven't been able to get it in in this release. And you might see that in a maintenance release afterwards. And, 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 mm -hmm. and just, just one yeah. more. Mm -hmm. So uh, because for tagging, you require the metadata, and then, and then it's keep on read world. When you interpret the metadata at the time when you're reading or you're changing the metadata at the time to read, how do you uh, account for those types of situations? Um, do you have a specific uh, component that you're talking about? Right. It means, uh, so you're going to create another like external table? Yes. So that, for us, would, be, would count as another logical construct, right? It would just be another object, right? It would have pointers to what you did, but it would be a new thing, okay. right? Because you that's how you, in, okay. yeah, because you did some other transaction for it, right? So you did a schema on read, you created this thing, right? And then you did some aggregation or some work, and it created a new artifact. We have to track that together, even if it's a temporal thing. Even if it's deleted, we have to track it. In fact, one of the things that I don't talk about, um, and it's probably a good segue, is that we track, we have versioning and auditing. I don't know if I showed you that, but we actually track uh, what happened to an object when it was created, when it was manipulated, or when it was deleted. We have active state, whether it's active or deleted. And we also have uh, entity mutation and a whole bunch of other really cool things. All right, this is going to be used for compliance, right? So for things like chain of custody, um, you have to track those types of things. We have all that stuff actually in the back end. It's all incorporated. Um, in terms of visualization, we're still working on making it right. Um, one of the things that we're working on that's not going to be in this release is something like a, a time machine where we can make, manipulate nominal time, and we can be able to see the, the state uh, of the metadata at a point in time in the past, which is really helpful for you know, um, subpoenas or other types of situations. Right? OK, so let's jump over to component integration. If you have additional questions, we can take them at the end. Um, so the stuff in green, we've had that since the beginning. The stuff in white, you're going to get in 2.5, which is coming this summer. And the things that we're going to work on in terms of development will be the stuff in gray for this year. Right. Now, I can't promise when the GA date for that gray stuff's going to happen. I'll get in big trouble. But that's something that we're working on. Please feel free to monitor you know, Apache. That's available for everybody. One of the things that we do as, a, as Hortonworks, being an open source company, is we make sure that all of our development is done in the open. We really can't hide what we're doing. It's pretty obvious. Uh, one of the things that we're a little more guarded about is our future plans. So we have to be a little bit, you know, uh, we're a public company now, so we have to be a little bit more careful. Um, but you can kind of see where we're going in terms of those JIRAs, right? Um, if you want to kind of get to the gory details, um, you, for those who are taking pictures, feel free. My, my PowerPoint skills are maybe not great, but uh, we'll be distributing the PowerPoint um, deck as well. Um, those are the, the JIRAs in Apache that are pub publicly available to, to delve into if you like. Um, 
So um, one of the, the first bullet in the key benefits, uh, this is just to underscore that, that, that point, and it's an important one. Uh, we really want to be at the platform level, not the application level. And the reason why is there are some vendors out there that have end-to-end -end lineage, and it's great, it works, except that um, if you use that kind of a solution, you're kind of locked into that application. And the moment you go outside of that, you run into some problems. You have time series data, you're lobbing data in you know, every day. Uh, let's say you want to copy a partition, right? Uh, it's done outside of that tool. Well, now you suddenly have a compliance scenario, right? Chain of custody is def definitively broken and you'll fail an audit, which is not very good, right? So those types of scenarios can be problematic. The other thing is what happens if you want to use a different tool, right? Now you can't use two tools. So what you don't want to do is basically create more silos. You don't want to create a Hadoop cluster that's a silo for an application. That's perhaps not the right order of things, right? The whole point of building a data lake really is to get that collaborative piece, right? To get that predictive analytic insight, which is going to require you to combine data in ways that may not be obvious, right? right? That's why you hire data scientists. Okay, so here's the other picture. So those, uh, that's just a different way to look at it. All those things are reporting into Atlas. Um, really, a little bit about the way it works. We have a, a notion of a hook, which basically reports into Atlas. There is a notification tier in the middle that can cache that stuff, so we have a little bit of reliability, and we have message durability. If one side goes down, we can recover and replay messages. All those things that you would expect, right? Um, Scoop is interesting. Things that write on top of Scoop, like Teradata Connector, is covered, right? We track that. Um, it may not necessarily be the, the business metadata, but anything that you would pass to it, like a JDBC connection uh, string, we would catch all of that stuff, okay? Um, data that lands from Scoop that comes through a storm topology that, fi that Falcon loads uh, periodically into a hive table and then you do some aggregation. We can show you lineage of all of that, right? And the hooks are built into those projects. If you get the latest version of Falcon, Storm, you know, scoop, you actually get those connectors built in, right? So they're there already, right? We track it all. In fact, um, we're kind of unique in that um, no one else can actually do that type of lineage, right? In fact, we're expanding quite quickly. There's a question. Yes, sir. So are you using third party tools outside of that ecosystem um, for data ingestion? Does that work? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so I can use my pointer. Um, it, it's incidental that it happens to be green, by the way. Um, the custom activity reporter basically writes to our REST APIs, and um, our development team is hard at work actually finishing this document for me. <laughs> we're, we're going back. We're going to release it soon. Basically, it's, um, it's, it's basically shorthand for some of our uh, APIs to do some of the basic functions, right? Post, gets, uh, define a new data type, right? So you can create new types. So it's an extensible system, right? So again, there. Uh, so one of the things that it can do is also import lineage, import entities of things, right? You can create things that don't exist in Hadoop, right? You can define them and then link them to things that are. So you have quite a bit of flex flexibility. All those connectors at some point are going to basically call REST APIs anyway. So this is just doing it without some of uh, that automation, right? Did that answer your question? Okay, sorry about that if I did not. But that's a really important part, right? We really created a modular, flexible system. Yes, sir? I just want to ask one more question. Um, for Oracle, uh, Golden Gate connectors, you drop data into Hadoop. Will that also hook up to Apache Atlas and our those connectors uh, being built? Hmm, I'm going to have to table that one. I know that we had a couple of conversations with, with some folks at Golden Gate. Um, I Got to maybe drill down into that. Are, if they're using like a JDBC type of connection, perhaps we, we can probably handle that pretty easily. Um, if they're not, then we probably have to think about some other strategies. Right? Um, but basically, I wanted to show you the ecosystem, and we're growing. Right? I think we have a pretty good uh, coverage of components, and we actually have a tutorial for this. Um, it's in GitHub. I'll uh, share that link with you, so you can actually go and try this yourself. Oh, so the other thing is all this stuff is covered by Apache 2.0, as all of our platform is. So, you know, at some point, it's going to be pretty um, compelling to use Apache Atlas for data lineage because, you know, we pretty much give it away, right? If you want to use it only for a general purpose metadata repository, I've been talking a lot today, um, 
you can use that too. We handle the replication, the high availability already, right? So why would you want to recreate that? It's freely available for everybody to use. In fact, because it's Apache 2.0, you can actually package the whole thing in, including the UI and you know, uh, resell it if you so desired, right? Hopefully you won't do that. Okay, enterprise readiness, I'm gonna touch on this real quick. Um, so, like we mentioned earlier, it's highly reliable and scalable components. Active Directory uh, integration, I kind of showed you some of that with Ranger already. Rolling upgrade support, HTTP 2.5 forward. So that means once you install it, let's say you're running Hive, you've got long running jobs, and you want to upgrade a hook because we have better functionality or something else, um, you can do that, and that Hive service will continue to run. Right, and that's really what we want to do. We want to make sure that you know, the service interruption is minimal. Right? Once you get that data lake, people are going to be hitting that from all kinds of different workloads, potentially all day long. Right? BC, business continuity, DR capabilities, um, we have a number of best practices and we're much better at that now, primarily because we're using those uh, reliable and scalable subcomponents and performance. We've done quite a bit of work on the performance um, area. Right? Um, there we go. Um, we talked about most of this already. Um, solar Cloud, we're using HBase for our graph database persistence, and we're using Kafka Quorum for our messaging framework. So all those things are quite scalable and reliable already. If you already have these in your, um, in your shop, you can reuse them, right? You don't need to spin up another version of HBase, right, or Solar Cloud. You can just leverage them, right? That's really what we wanted to do. Um, before somebody asks about solar licensing, if you are using Apache Atlas, and you don't have a separate you know, license for solar, that's okay. As long as you're using it for Atlas, that's covered, right? Just to nail that question in advance. I've been asked before, obviously. Business catalog, we talked about this earlier today, um, and this is just the highlights, right? So the catalog itself is really to help classify your data, right? To answer what you've got, right? Data lineage, we talked about this already. Um, impact analysis, compliance, chain of custody scenarios, but also things like acceptable use, right? Somebody, uh, a gentleman over there talked about, you know, tag propagation, right? If you have a derivative data set, that tag should follow. We're working on that, it's on our roadmap. But that's only part of the picture, right? You want also things like lineage to help you dis determine, oh, my time is up, they said. So I'm gonna go through really quickly. So it helps you with acceptable use policies, right? Same user, same data, but you can use it for a certain purpose or not, depending on where that data came from. So it's really important to have that, right? All right, so I'm going to, um, actually I covered most of the stuff already in the other session. Um, I'm gonna leave this slide up while I take, uh, tear, take my uh, stuff down together. If you have any questions, I'm gonna be in the back of the rooms. Feel free to, to join me. The Ranger team is here if you have any Ranger specific questions. I believe there was one question in the back that we can address. Thank you very much for your time.